All right, hey, if you just watched the other video, and I'm linking these together because I, I, I don't want to make an hour-long video or three-hour long or, well, let's be frank, ten-hour <laughs> long, right? I mean, lunch is coming. <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> so yeah, I just I want to make sure that we get to the, we get some details here. So we're going to do this video. We have a 15 GMC. Mm -hmm. We have the 07 uh, Chevy. Yep. Um, the, that's a newer Duramax in that one, right? That, that is the LML. We have an LML. Mm -hmm. We have L, L, that LBC. LBZ right here. Yep. So we have different uh, different Duramaxes. And we have some really interesting differences. And and if you haven't, if you didn't catch the first video, this is Brooke. I'm Tim. My fashion is trucks SUVs. Um, we're, we're, we have a million mile truck we're sitting in, and the 15 is the GMC. That's his work truck. We're going to kind of reference that in here in this video. But we have a single rear wheel. We have a dually rear, rear wheel. We have a really interesting differences here. So let's let's start first of all from your experience driving both Duramaxes. Mm -hmm. What what's your differences? What what kind of comes off? Uh, well. There's several. One, uh, let's just start with the simple stuff. Tire pressures. You know, uh, whenever I went with a single rear wheel, I knew that I would be taking a little bit of a hit on stability in windy conditions. Uh, you only got four sidewalls back there. You don't, you know. Right. You don't have eight. And so uh, I found really adjusting pressures really paid off. And it, like I say, just a few PSI, you know, like 5% makes a big difference in, you know, ride quality versus stability if you've got windy conditions uh, versus have, you, you always have to have, of course, enough pressure to handle your load, but then you can, you can just tune your ride uh, based on tire pressures. So I don't, I don't think people deal with that as much, but like I say, uh, on the racetrack, uh, run, run my car on road course, I mean, we go like half a PSI you know, changes. Sure. It's like, how do you want to run at the end, end of the end of the session or, or start, whatever, you know, so. But that's a huge topic because I know a lot of people that won't tow an RV without a dually. They just, they won't do it. Right. And like I say, it's, it all depends on what you're comfortable with, right? Uh, a lot of people don't like driving a car down a gravel road, right? Sure. Uh, but then you have plenty of other people. It's like, they're, they, they do it every day. That they'll fly down the road at 60 miles an hour like a rally car driver. They 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 don't mind that loose feeling, you know. It's like they're they're comfortable with it, and that's kind of the trade off. I mean, the I actually purchased since since I hadn't done you know towing to the level that I was planning on doing. I have a dual rear wheel because I said I'm going to be dead stable. I want the longest wheelbase. I want the widest track because I'm not sure what I'm going to encounter. Now, after I put a million miles on this, I said, I don't need the dually, but it was also a matter of GVWR ratings. I don't have my CDL, so I have to take the GVWR of the truck plus the trailer. It has to be less than 26,000 pounds. This truck, even though it's a dually, has a GVWR of 11,400. That 15 has a GVWR of 11,600. These trucks just keep on getting more and more, more capable. capable. Sure. So I didn't want a dually configuration with a 13,300 or whatever it is, you know, yeah. uh, because that would limit my trailer size. Sure. And, so, and you don't have a problem towing with a single either, so. I don't, but I pay attention to the pressures back mm -hmm. there. And, and I, I tune it, you know, just on the road. It's like, you're going to make a fuel stop. You're going to check the lugs on these brand new trailers, right? You, anytime you put a wheel up to a hub for the first time, you torque it, you're not done, go down the road, and then recheck re them. Same way with these trucks, once, once you get them rotated and balanced, make sure you recheck. Once you don't get any movement, then you're good to go. But, okay. Now, let's talk through, why did you buy the 15 <coughs> if you already had this 07? A cu couple different reasons. Uh, one, I did want a new office. You see up here, I've got a little speaker for my phone. Right. And that's a little little bit difficult to hear whenever you're talking to people. I wanted something fully integrated, right? But the other thing, it's got a million miles on it. Sure. I've already learned that, you know, I had to replace injectors at six hundred and sixteen thousand. So here this truck's already got, you know, four hundred thousand on that set of injectors. So then you got, you know, you know upcoming injector expense and maybe a power steering pump, you know, maybe, maybe all this stuff just adds up 
And it's like, oh, do I want to make a truly poor financial decision and put, you know, I could put $10,000 into this truck, putting new components on it, yet nobody would pay me any more for it if I needed to get rid of it. Yeah, sure. So it's like, you know what? Found found that one on the used market. Like I say, at 93,000 miles, a lot of people are saying, man, I'm going to be running out of that 100,000 mile powertrain warranty. And they just want to get rid of it. And for me, I was confident. It's like, that's prime for the picking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, get, it's just broke in. Right, you right, know? sure. And, and I, I'd seen those things about the CP4 pump. And I'm like, you know what? If it hasn't blown up, you know, in 93,000 miles, then I, I know I'm way I'm going to drive it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be uh, needing all that. I'm not going to be asking, you know, for over the top or put a crazy tune on or sure, anything sure. like that. So, and, and it's been good for me in that respect. And we alluded to that in the other video we did, and these videos kind of went <clears> together. But if you didn't catch that video, there's a uh, there's actually a lawsuit right now in General Motors about the the uh, CP4. It's a fuel pump made by Bosch. It's in the that Duramax he has in the uh, 15 the LML. And uh, I'll link to that video above. And it's interesting. I either hear from owners that say. Oh, that's a huge issue, and they make they actually make a kit now you can buy to convert it. I mean, there's a whole aftermarket behind it, but or I hear from owners that say, eh, they, right. you know, it, it's it's just an interesting thing. All I can tell you is my experience, you know, and I I don't uh, you know, I, I do. I can t only tell you my experience. Yeah. You know, if, if people have had bad experience, I, I do feel bad for them, but you know that hasn't been my experience. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. So the other main difference here, and if you don't know this, is that in 07, most manufacturers are required to do emissions um, at, for the diesels. There's a, a lot of particulates come out of the engine and say do an emission system on this. And they added a fuel to, additive. It's called DEF. It's diesel exhaust fluid. And it shoots a spray in your exhaust, and it takes out some of the NOx of the noxious chemicals going in the air. And so the 07 we're in right now does not have that. The, the 07 just has... The catalytic converter, right, and then muffler, and then in 08 with the LMM, I believe it is. My brother has a couple of those trucks. Uh, that was the introduction of the diesel particulate filter, and GM on the LMM, they just whenever you have to uh, inject fuel to burn off the soot accumulated in the filter, and which is called a regen cycle. There right. you go. And, and in the LMM, they did that, as I understand, by just uh, putting more fuel in the eight injectors of a cylinder. And that, that's how you got the extra fuel to burn off the soot in the, in the DPF. And of course, no SCR or DEF fluid system on that one. Uh, the 15, the LML, which actually started in 11 model year, uh, they have the DPF of course, but then they added the SCR and, and the DEF system. Okay. So that, that's the exact same system as in my 15 here. So a lot of people have, um, they don't like DEF, they don't like adding it. So let's talk about that first. How often do you, did you add DEF? Well, I, I would carry around uh, two, two and a half gallon jugs like all the time because uh, DEF usage rates are based on how much fuel you use. And so in, in general, some of the numbers I, I saw early on whenever I was keeping track of it is if I'm empty, then I would get like a thousand miles per gallon of def uh, and then if i was loaded then it of course depend on how heavy the trailer was and how much fuel i was using but in general 250 to 400 road miles per gallon of def uh, so but the problem is it, it's all on you know it is all, all a product of fuel usage rates and then as your dpf gets older then it doesn't do as good a job of getting all the soot removed and cleaned. And so it'll kind of, I don't know, I want to use the term trick itself, but it, it, it doesn't clean it fully. And so where I was uh, beginning to have some problems <clears throat> is you would, it would try, it would go into regen mode more often, right? Uh, th there's like a, a, a ceiling and a floor like build from zero to 40 grams of soot, for example. Whenever I got the truck with 93,000 miles, that uh, that floor was like two or three grams. But over the, the years and the miles, it would build up to like 
at 400,000 or 450,000 miles, it would be up to 18 grams. It would do a full regen and then it would come back to like 18 grams. You're already starting off almost halfway. Sure. Uh, and so you, you build soot again and then it burn again. So then you're using more fuel and then you're using more def. Okay. So. But, you know, understand something. We're talking about this is this is a lot of usage, though. I mean, you, you put that, that's the thing. thousand miles. And, and I, I spoke to another another driver with, with a, a similar model year truck. And that number for him was about 400,000 as well, where, where you started having, uh, you know, Knox sensor issues and stuff like that. And so, yeah, that that's that's pretty good usage. And uh, I've of course, I talked to. Ram drivers, uh, I know uh, a couple of those that I really respect what they say, and for their business model, they, they do things a little bit different. One, uh, he basically buys and trades trucks every 250,000 miles, just gets rid of the issue, go grab a new truck, and he's working with a dealership that can move a truck that just has 250,000 miles on it. You know, if I tried to move that truck that has 500, yeah. nah, they nobody's going to give me any money for it. Uh, another Ram driver, uh, he went and got his system cleaned, which typically is a little bit of a band-aid. You know, you don't, it's not like brand new DPF, whatever, but that has gotten him by to where he puts some more miles on his truck. But, uh. So from your experience now, do you think that you could take uh, like a, a 19 or the, the newer truck or 15 as well? Mm -hmm. Do you think you could take that to a million miles? Do you think you would do it without, without... For your business model, without mm -hmm. dumping in so much money into that to get to that point, you know, I just based on what I've learned in taking this one to five hundred thousand, I would like to see a better way to go ahead and clean that DPF, get get that DPF back in order because it, it's an expensive proposition, and it's like four thousand dollars to put a new DPF on there because it's all it's all constructed out of one one. Unit. One one unit, sure. You know, including tailpipe and stuff like that. So, uh, on medium duties and more over the road trucks, I mean, it's designed in a more serviceable manner, right? You can go to like an international dealer, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you know, pull it in, and we'll." They they got stuff they can clean the DPF right there. Now, you know, I don't know if it's ever as good as a new one, but the fact that the engineers, it's already designed for that sort of usage, you know. And so uh, that, that's what I'm not seeing from uh, these trucks right now is, yeah, you can't just un unbolt something and say, okay, let's clean it, and then we'll move on. Yeah, so there's a lot more maintenance as you're getting up those in the miles. Yeah. Um, what about, like, power output? Are you noticing any differences from yourself on the power output between the two engines? That LML is stout. I mean, I was always amazed at the power uh, of this LBZ in Big Red, and growing up on a farm where... Your your bread and butter motor was a 350, right. you know, sure. tuned or whatever. But it was just night and day difference. But the LML, it, it does seem to be, uh, you know, got a little bit more capacity, stouter. Uh, some of that can be a bad thing, right? I love, like I say, this road's been off the truck for a couple of years, but I love looking out over the hood. You've got more slope because why? You don't have to have as big a radiator, Right. Whenever you go to increasing that ceiling for capacity level, everything else has to grow. Yep. And that's one, one of the negatives is I, I don't uh, I prefer the visibility of this truck to the, the LML. That's a very interesting point because the I just drove the new 19s and it's a really tall hood. Yeah. I, and so, but from your standpoint, I mean, I'm sitting in the truck right now and you can definitely see over this hood. Absolutely. Yep. Huh. Um, what about um, ride quality? Are, have you noticed anything different with suspension when you're driving around unloaded? You know, I, I have, uh, and and more so in uh, I see, you know, just winter weather driving performance. Uh, it, it was a big step up in terms of torsional stiffness. Uh, that 15, it's got the fully hydroformed tubes, you know, and... Uh, it's a very rigid chassis, and that's great in the dry whenever you're pulling heavy trailers, big pin weight, and all that. Uh, moving back into this truck, I was like, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it was noticeable. And I, call, I call Big Red, you know, a flexible flyer in respect because it's got the C-channel running back. 
it's just got hydroform portions up front near the front subframe but uh you you can definitely tell a difference in the torsional rigidity between the two trucks and a negative to the increased rigidity is the winter weather driving performance because it the, the new truck just doesn't quite seem to follow the the small imperfections the small dips in the roadway the way this truck will because you know this truck it's not just tire and uh, shock performance it's actually you know so anyway as far as an ice truck i mean obviously yeah this is a dually some people are going to say well dude you got two two extra rear tires sure but it, it's more than that it's like up front you have basically the same weight uh, on that axle, uh, but on Big Red, I've just got little 215s, and in hard packed snow and ice, you know, pounds per square inch, you got it in spades with Big Red, so it will get down and find traction where where the new truck will not. Mm. And then on, on the back, then if you are fighting some wind, well, you, yeah, you do have eight sidewalls, but like I say, it's, it's just, uh, it's a lot better planted for, for those sketchy conditions yeah so um continuing on differences um any issues with transmissions on both trucks both duramax or uh, both allison transmissions both allison transmissions I, i've done the same thing in uh, in 2011 they actually pretty darn sure it was 2011 when they went to the lml they upgraded the torque converter and you know i uh, ha- haven't haven't Felt the need to do anything. That uh, that truck is stock. I mean, no no upgrades to that or no tunes, anything no like tunes. that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so what about um, this? Comes up quite a bit in some of my conversations. Automatic transmissions on both. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen guys do manual transmissions? Do you miss not having a manual transmission in, in the in the heavy duty truck? There's currently, if you don't know this, it's currently zero. There's zero new trucks with manual transmissions. And every once in a while, I hear some guys who um, miss that. You know, like say I, uh, I do high performance driving on track. Did for several years, fifteen years, and I loved my manual. I loved my manual more than the new and latest and greatest uh, dual clutch transmissions and the greatest technology that you know BMW, Porsche, Cor- Corvette. What is just I like my manual for doing that sort of driving. Sure, but we we don't see a. Uh, manual. I guess Dodge was the last one to actually have one. Yep, they were. And it always had to be what? Mated to an engine that was detuned because they didn't, it couldn't withstand the full torque capacity of the, the newer motors. And for for those that just do not like the idea, <clears throat> and, and that's what I believe it is, they don't like the idea of an automatic transmission, and, and neither did I, because if you've only been associated uh, with you know, the typical slush box, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Then, yeah, you don't want to, you, you want more control. You want, you know, that direct feedback. But this Allison is an amazing thing. And whenever you hit tow haul mode, it will lock the torque converter in as early as second gear. And it is very positive. The shifts are positive. You, you won't miss a manual. Okay. You, you'll appreciate the efficiency and the ability to control uh, that that you do have, and with that in mind, I uh, had a friend. Like I say, whenever I lived in South Carolina, uh, he was a big Ram guy, and the first time he got in Big Red, uh, we were doing some wireless consulting work, and we needed to grab some equipment. You know, four wheel low, go go play mountain goat, right, right. and uh, we 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 were coming back into town. You know, and uh, I had tow, tow haul engaged, and we're coming to a stoplight. And, you know, the, this Allison, you know, we're coming, you know, just downshifting like that. And he's like, are you doing that? Because we, we both do high performance driving school. Sure, sure. And I'm like, no, man, that's Duramax Allison powertrain. It just takes care of you. And he's like, that was pretty amazing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then whenever we wheeled into a parking lot, I, I saw a spot we were needing to get some supplies at, at a Lowe's, and I pull in there and I just full lock this 156 inch you know truck, and with the independent front suspension, which I knew was different from his Ram, mm-hmm. you know, and 
is like, boom, just turned it full lock and went. Really? Just th- threw it in that parking spot. Yeah, because like, that's not happening. It, he, he, yeah. He's like, I can't do that. In my, and he had owned a Ford previously, of course, both with solid front axles. Yep. I'm like, well, that's one of the benefits, just one of the benefits, you know. And I know, like I say, there are other applications where that solid front axle, that is what you want, maybe. But for what I'm doing, I really have had great luck and performance out of my independent front suspension. Yeah, that's been an interesting thing going on. So I've had a few comments on the channel about this, um, especially with we did the Tahoe Suburban unveil last week. They went independent rear suspension as well as independent front. Right. But if you don't know the differences here, uh, Chevy, I have a 62, has independent front suspension. I mean, they've done independent front suspensions for years, but Ford and Ram or Dodge back then, Dodge Ram now, uh, have never done independent front suspension. And so did that did that weigh in your, in your thinking about what you're towing and, and hauling? Did you think about whether the... What you want on the front end? Uh, absolutely. And even though in general, uh, I'm a GM guy, I grew up, we, we happen to have Chevrolet trucks on the farm and everything. But whenever it came to a business decision, mm-hmm. right, I put my butt in the seat. I went to my Ram dealer. I went to the Ford dealer. And I wanted to drive. And uh, I just, like I say, I just love the steering feel of the independent front suspension and the ride quality, and knowing that, you know, I mean, I, I've actually had, had some people uh, say, well, I, I didn't like that GM truck because it, it rode like a Cadillac. And I'm like, you know, teach their own. I mean, yeah, if you sure. want, you know, uh, some, some people need to have a, a stiffer ride to feel like they're riding a truck. And by the way, for those of you that are in that arena, by all means, jack your air pressures up, you know, <laughs> and, and r- ride that buckboard, you know. But I knew I was going to be spending a lot of time behind the wheel. And like I say, I wanted the long wheelbase because that's going to give you a better ride. And, you know, at the end of a long day, I still felt rested. You know, I, I didn't feel beat up. It's like, boom, let's go do it again. You yeah. know? Sure. So. So, and speaking about that as well, we were talking about earlier, um, this truck doesn't have any, what we're calling driver aids. You just have... You have cruise control. Mm-hmm. You have an d- exhaust brake in this. No. Nope. No no exhaust brake in no this. No exhaust brake on this one. So, but the 15, you have an exhaust brake. 15 has the exhaust brake. And so, right, let's start there. So, what do you, when you drive the differences, do you, do you prefer the exhaust brake? Do you prefer braking your, I mean, how, how does that factor into your comfort? You know, it's, uh, it's all about learning the capabilities of your machine and then being able to make the right choices whenever you're on the road. Okay. Uh, knowing that I didn't have an exhaust brake, there's lots of times I would, you know, in tow haul mode, and that changes the, the shift logic in the Allison, of course. But then you've got your tap shifter, so if I needed a little more compression braking, whatever, I would just go down maybe one extra gear, right? right? And uh, and that, of course, you know, all that changes depending on exactly what trailer you're towing and then what conditions you have out there on the road and whatnot. Uh, with the new truck, I find that I don't use the exhaust brake that often, but I will in icy conditions because it, it seems to be, you know, because at that point I'm locked in four-wheel drive anyway. So you know, whenever I hit the exhaust brake, I've got all, all four contact patches helping to slow me down. And it just seems less abrupt than if, you know, you do a, a service apply. Sure. Right, and with the way that exhaust brake is, if you can actually modulate the throttle, you know, once it's engaged, and reduce the amount of braking, or or just let it go on its own. Uh, and I, I will add, uh, whenever just read read the owner's manual on any machine that you purchase, just go through it, because you, you're you're going to run across features that it's like, oh, okay, yeah, and one one of the cool things about, uh, you know, I want to know how to, how that system was designed and intended. And whenever you set the cruise control on that and just leave it in automatic, it does an amazing job with, with the exhaust brake. I keep pointing down here. That's where the exhaust brake is on the LMO. Uh, but uh, it, it does an amazing job uh, of, of modulating that for you, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, and, and sometimes... Like I say, depending on conditions, I make that choice. It's like, I just let it do everything automatically. Sometimes I want a little bit more control. 
based on conditions. It gives you options. Okay. So uh, the only negative I've had uh, with that is uh, I, this last trip, I pulled a trailer through uh, I-70, you know, Rockies, and uh, in, in some pretty poor weather conditions. And so I was using that exhaust brake, and once I got to uh, oh, Grand Junction, Colorado, one of the first things I did at my fuel stop, checked your oil. Because certainly on a vehicle with half a million miles on it, uh, but even whenever it had less than that, it's like it will tend to consume some oil whenever you're using that exhaust brake. Hmm. So that's interesting. I don't, I don't know how to, you know. Yeah, that, yeah. But anyway, so that's that's one of the you know negatives. If oil consumption is negative, then uh, yeah, okay. it uses some more oil. So just check check your oil. And yeah, we were talking a little bit offline earlier about this as well. And there's other safety features. So we have a there's adaptive cruise control, lane departure assist. There's all the stuff we have going on with trucks now. Um, but that doesn't sound like it's something you're really shopping for. You're, you're just looking for capability and looking for. The end powertrain you like. Absolutely. You know, and, and some, some of these drive raids, you know, unfortunately, uh, I think just human nature, you know, I mean, we're, we're going to start relying on those rather than staying focused on the road. Sure. You know, I mean, I mean, if I asked you today, it's like, what, what's your mom's telephone number, right? Yeah, uh, for yeah. mobile phone. It's like, no, it, it's all in that little box. You know, we, 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 I used to know all the numbers of my friends, right? But now I don't have to remember it, so I don't. Uh, but there's been some negatives uh, I, I can see, you know, with current technology at least. Like I say, I haven't driven a vehicle with lane departure and stuff like that, but, you know, whenever you're using cameras to make those decisions for you, there's going to be conditions out there on the roadway where, you know, maybe you got some ra rainy conditions or it has rained and you've got uh, depressions in, in the in the asphalt due to heavy truck traffic and then you're going into the sun and all of a sudden what have you got ahead of you you've got in your in your wheel tracks it appears to be almost like a white painted line yeah you know it's just a wet road surface camera's not picking up on that it it says what are you doing you know uh, so yeah, I can't. I can't imagine you see much distracted driving at all. On oh your my trails. gosh! <laughs> you know, you you asked me. It's like, well, why why would you go there? Because I I trust bad weather more than I trust some of these drivers nowadays. <laughs> I will rather go with the northern route, you know, and, and test my driving skills than you know just out of nowhere somebody, you know. Right. Sure. Because one of the negatives about RV transport is, it, you know, I'm in control. I'm in charge of that uh, possession of that trailer. So it's my responsibility. If some clown decides to damage, you know, yeah, I'm paying the insurance deductible. Sure. 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 <laughs> right. And and so the, that that that'll tell you where the state of uh, where I think state of drivers are in general. Whenever I would I would choose bad road conditions over, you know, the uncertainty of uh, some of these drivers. But like I say, I I really wish we we had more programs like the uh, BMW CCA Foundation has with their Street Survival Program that teaches teenagers, not just in the classroom or whatever, but puts them in their car. Yep. You know, real world's like, oh, this is what an ABS stop is. So, anyway. That's one of the things that's in the RV industry that's been talked about is that when you're doing these big RVs, you're almost as long as some of these semis are. <laughs> and you don't need extra classes to drive an RV. Right. You don't need... All right, it's not required to do it, but you, you should take them. Well, you can... Uh... You know, it's right now a lot of it's just based on the, the whether you have a CDL or not and what the the combined gross weight rating is, you know, between truck and, and trailer. But like I say, with, with Big Red here being 11.4, I mean, I've towed, you know, bumper pull uh, GVWR trailers of 14,000 pounds, but they were 44 foot long. Yeah. That's the, that's the box. I mean, I'm, I'm at, you know, I'm uh, maybe 42. I don't know. It's been a while ago. We, we don't really don't, we, we'll do the 38 and 40s now, but uh, anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is a big deal. And, uh, whenever you're doing something like that, 
I've, I've been going through Montana and a gust of wind hit me with one of those large guys and perfectly dry roads, beautiful conditions, moved the, the ass of this truck sideways. Now, it, it only has to be a couple of inches and it feels like a foot, right, right. from the driver's seat. Sure. But still, that was in perfect conditions, but you've got so much surface area. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, uh, I was helping uh, an older gentleman hook up one of these trailers that's a little bit different from a typical RV. And, and I said, so, hey, you know, what? You know, he come asking me for, for assistance, and I was glad to provide some uh, through my experience. And he, uh, I said, so you, you haven't been doing this too long. If this is the first time you've hooked up one of these. Like, no, no, I used to drive a big rig. He said, I'll tell you what, though, this is the scariest damn thing I've ever done <laughs> with, with, with these light, lightweight, high-profile vehicles, right? And, sure. And, yeah, whenever you're going, going through states like Wyoming, yep. uh, you know, stuff like that, well, yeah, you, you always have to be, be aware of the conditions. But Do you anyway. think there's any differences when you're driving the two different trucks and you're doing those loads and the winds and stuff? Does, is that truck more stable? Is this truck more stable? Is the powertrain... Uh, what do you think? That that's where the the dually pays dividends, and you know the the added track width and the extra sidewalls of having four tires back there. Uh, it, it's it's a better situation for the wind. Yeah. It's definitely more stable, even though it's got a flexible flyer chassis compared to that one. Uh, it's all it's all about. Uh, I mean, I, I've driven in some some higher winds uh, conditions there, and whenever I arrived at my fuel stop. There's little little bits of rubber, little little you know, just where it worked that sidewall so hard against the the wheel. Really? Yeah. Huh. So you get getting a lot of deflection, you know, and so that's why I say you, you really got to stay on top of your pressures. You know, it's like okay, well, since, since I got this fairly high wind, I'm going to compromise some ride quality just for stability, right? right? So sure. go ahead and bump them up. Sure. But. Uh, so uh, that brings another question up. Um, with the earlier video, if you haven't seen that, I'll link, again, that's linked above and linked at the end, we talked about tire usage. You mm-hmm. get some amazing miles out of these tires, which Michelin's probably going to call you up here in a little bit and talk to you about this. But anyways, 177,000 to 192,000. Are you noticing any difference in tire wear on the the 15 versus the big red? Yeah. I, I'm not getting that level of, of mileage out of these tires. But some of that's because... Fuel's not four and five dollars a gallon, like it was whenever. Uh, like say, I was driving like there's an egg under the throttle, right? Right. You know? And uh, so, I, I actually work these tires harder. Sure. Just in general, you okay. know. But uh, yeah, about like say, I've had a couple sets of tires on there. Uh, I had one brand of tire. I, I like trying new things. It's not like oh, I love these Michelin LTX AT twos and that. No, I'm I'm kind of a tire guy. I, you know, I, I will uh, do some research on tires, and by the way, the the tires that are on there right now have been great. Uh, they happen to be Michelin uh, Agilis Cross Climate, which is a brand new offering that Michelin has with a stiffer sidewall, built more for a commercial driver, and it has a three peak snowflake symbol on the side. That makes a difference for us commercial drivers out out west yep, yep. Uh, with chain laws, etc. But those have been great tires. Those have uh, close to 100,000 on them right now. They're down to like 630 seconds, I think. But uh, So not quite the longevity uh, on the single rear wheel truck as far as, you know, that. Right. Now, I just attribute that to, yeah, whenever you're putting power down hauling, then you still have more surface area, more contact patch here with a dually. And that's, that's, a, that's a difference between those two. And if you don't know about that, so the the snow mark on that tire, um, I've seen in the Colorado, especially through the Rockies, mm-hmm. they have tire tire laws in effect different parts of the year, and because well, it gets nasty on top of Eisenhower um, tunnels and different places in the past, this rabbit ears pass, and so if you have the snow mark on there, you, you do not need snow chains, right? Is that the I'm trying to remember the, how that law worked? It's, yeah, you've got uh, for normal passenger car vehicles, and you go on their website. And it will tell you, like for me, I had to go there and see if they considered me a commercial motor vehicle. And they have, if you're this and you have to meet one of these three conditions, well, I didn't meet any of those three, right? So if they'd actually put up the sign that said chain law in effect for commercial motor vehicles, 
I wouldn't have to adhere to that. I would, you know, I'd be good with those tires. Right, right. Uh, but, yeah, they, they'll have, like, level one, which is for, you know, for passenger cars. It's like you got to either have traction tires or use chains, you know, if you see this sign. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything I'm missing? Anything that you've, you've noticed difference between this, these two trucks that uh, I'm not... I'm not thinking. What about like you know? I, I'm sure basic things like headlights are probably a little bit brighter in those. And <laughs> seeing stuff. You, you know what? <laughs> that this this truck it's a 15, but it, it's an early build. You, you'll notice it has the same wheels as the 14, okay. the the older sheet metal, which I actually like these eight spoke, eight lug, eight spoke. Fine, makes sense. Uh, but the, those those mirrors are not the updated square mirrors that Chevy used. They're the same thing on my 07, you know? Yeah, I was looking. I was, like, right. We had these trucks together, so I, I it's just some B-roll I'm walking out of. This is B-roll on the screen. But I did notice that. The mirrors are the exact same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so uh, I'm sure just whenever they got rid of those mirrors and those wheels, then they said, okay, now let's start building. Sure, sure. But uh, regarding the headlights, those headlights, being an early build 15, they don't have LED like daytime running lamps and like they did on the, the later versions. But that's a projector beam, but it is on all the time. Hmm. Okay? It is your daytime. Right. It is your low beam. And your high beam is the same filament. Huh. <laughs> they, they just raise a shutter. Sure. It's like, oh, there's your high. Yeah. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this video series. And like I said, I'll do link both videos together, and you can check them out. Really good information to watch if you're towing, if you're, if you're doing Duramax, you're doing diesels. It's just really a fascinating conversation. So, hey, for more, it's very fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for more Pickup Truck Plus SUV news, make sure you find us at pickuptruckdoc.com. Three words again, work on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Trust me, we're there. I've done it. As always, thanks for watching. We will see you down the road.